In this video series, we're discussing the anatomy and function of the five terminal branches of the brachial plexus. This complex web of nerve fibers originates from the C5 to T1 nerve roots and produces five major nerves that supply most of the functions of your arm and forearm. We've already covered the anatomy of the axillary and musculocutaneous nerves, so today we'll be looking at the huge radial nerve. The radial nerve is a bit like the posterior counterpart of the musculocutaneous nerve and supplies most of the muscles that extend the upper limb at the elbow and wrist joints, as well as a large portion of the sensation to the posterior upper limb. It originates from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and receives contributions from all five of its nerve roots, C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1. It exits the axilla just posterior to the axillary artery, just underneath the caracobrachialis muscle. As it does, it passes through an area known as the triangular interval. This area is bounded superiorly by the teres major and latissimus dorsi muscles, and medially and laterally by the long and lateral heads of the triceps brachii muscles, respectively. Passing with it through this interval is the deep brachial or profunda brachii artery. The radial nerve and profunda brachii will travel with each other for much of their route down the arm. From now on, it's a bit easier to view the radial nerve and its branches from a posterior view. We'll switch back to the anterior later. As it passes through this area, the radial nerve produces a sensory branch that takes information from the skin overlying the back of the lower arm, known as the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm. The radial nerve continues along with the profunda brachii artery down the back of the arm, passing obliquely from medial to lateral, in a depression known as the spiral groove of the humerus. The specific branching pattern of the radial nerve in this region is variable and controversial in the literature, but importantly it produces a number of branches in and around the spiral groove. The first three are all motor branches to the long, medial and lateral heads of the triceps brachii muscle, which lies over the top of the nerve. This three-bellied muscle acts as the main extensor of the arm at the elbow. Then we have the long, specific nerve to the anconeus muscle. This may arise as its own entity or as a branch of the nerve to the lateral head of the triceps. This peculiar branch travels down most of the length of the humerus before briefly piercing the medial head of triceps brachii and re-emerging distally to innovate the tiny anconeus muscle, which is a weak extensor of the arm at the elbow. The remaining branches within the spiral groove are all sensory. One small branch to the lateral arm, known as the inferior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, and the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm. The latter of these is a very large sensory nerve that takes sensation from the skin overlying most of the posterior lateral forearm. It terminates all the way down at the wrist joint. Let's look back at the anterior view for a bit. As the radial nerve leaves the spiral groove, it passes just anterior to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus to enter the cubital fossa. Here it divides into two major branches, one posterior, which is mostly motor, known as the deep branch, and one anterior, which is purely sensory, known as the superficial branch. The superficial branch passes down the forearm underneath the brachioradialis muscle until just proximal to the wrist joint, where it winds around posteriorly to enter the hand behind the thumb. As it enters the hand, it passes through the famous anatomical snuff box which is a region in the back of the hand bounded medially by the tendon of extensor pollicis longus, laterally by extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus, and proximally by the styloid process of the radius. After entering the snuff box, the superficial branch of the radial nerve will split into its numerous dorsal digital nerves, which take sensation from the thumb and lateral fingers. In total, the superficial branch of the radial nerve is responsible for sensation in most of the lateral wrist and thenar eminence, the posterior lateral hand, and the skin overlying the backs of the lateral three and a half digits, not including the fingertips. In contrast to the superficial branch, the deep branch of the radial nerve passes posteriorly. Its first important contribution is to the lateral forearm muscles found in a group known as the mobile wad of Henry the extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and brachioradialis. 
These muscles are predominantly elbow flexors and wrist extensors. After innovating the mobile wad, the nerve passes backwards through the forearm into the posterior compartment. In here it provides motor innovation to most of the extensor muscles of the wrists and fingers. Let's look again from the posterior view. I'll remove the posterior cutaneous nerve which we've already discussed to make it a little clearer to see. The deep branch starts by passing between the fibres of the supinator muscle, which it innervates. As it emerges between these fibres, it changes its name to the posterior interosseous nerve, which it will be known as for the remainder of its course. This branch passes down the forearm in the plane between the superficial and deep extensor muscles. About two thirds of the way down, it travels deep to the extensor pollicis longus muscle, where it meets the interosseous membrane, which connects the ulna and radius bones. At its most distal extent, the deep branch of the radial nerve provides a small sensory contribution to the wrist joint. The deep branch of the radial nerve innervates every muscle in the posterior compartment of the forearm. There are eight of these and their names can be a bit confusing and a bit distracting, so I won't recall them all. Maybe you could list them for us in the comments section. So, that's the radial nerve in all its glory. This important nerve is the largest in the whole upper limb and is vitally important for its functioning. Partly because of its size, it's also the most commonly injured nerve in the arm, most often due to fractures of the humerus or compression at the axilla, known as Saturday night palsy. Damage to the motor branches may result in wrist drop, which can have devastating impacts on a patient's day-to-day -day life. Alright, there you go. That's a lot of information to process, so feel free to take your time to read around the topic and re-watch the video if you found it helpful. I'll be releasing videos covering the remainder of the terminal branch of the brachial plexus over the next few weeks, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out. In the meantime, I hope you learned something, and have a great day.